This uh, uh, project forms part of a PhD through the University of Wollongong under the supervision of Professor Liz Halcombe, Dr Jane Desborough from ANU and um, Dr Susan McGuinness whom you've just heard from. So just as a background, general practice is the first point of contact for patients with the healthcare system where an ageing population and increases in the chronic disease burden have facilitated policy and funding incentives encouraging nursing workforce growth. In the general practice setting, 67.2% of GPN or general practice nurse and patient encounters consist of disease specific health education. Modifiable lifestyle risk behaviours such as smoking, inadequate nutrition, harmful alcohol intake and inadequate physical activity have significantly contributed to that chronic disease burden. Promotion of healthy lifestyles and reducing lifestyle risk behaviours can optimise the health and delay the onset of chronic disease, but often require both patient commitment and health practitioner support. In an effort to reduce the size and severity of the chronic disease burden, coordinated and preventative models of care are required. Within this context, this study aims to examine the factors which influence the delivery of lifestyle risk communication by registered nurses within the Australian general practice setting. So embedded within a mixed methods approach, this qualitative descriptive study sought to understand GPN experiences of lifestyle risk communication. 15 GPNs uh, were recruited from southeastern New South Wales and the Canberra Primary Health Networks. Nurses who participated in the videoing of chronic disease management consultations between nurses and patients uh, were interviewed and a mix of face-to-face -face and telephone semi-structured interviews were undertaken until data saturation was, had occurred and all were audio recorded with thematic analysis of verbatim transcriptions informed by Braun and Clark. So this is how I conceptualised what the findings were in four key themes. The general practice nurse enablers and barriers, perceived patient enablers and barriers. With trust and rapport at the heart of that and some structural influences um, Yes, overseeing that. So first of all, the GPN enablers and barriers in undertaking lifestyle risk communication largely related to education, competing priorities, experience and autonomy. Nurse perceptions about the amount or whether lifestyle risk was discussed largely depended on time and prioritisation of the activity within the appointment structure. There was a perception that GPs did not have time to effectively prioritise lifestyle risk discussions. And within ex existing appointment parameters, GPN's discussion of lifestyle risk was opportunistic and determined by GPN education and experience, as well as following assessment of the patient's presenting issues, diagnosis, referrals, patient notes, gaps in care and biometric measures. Nurses wanted accessible education in lifestyle risk communication. Some nurses had undertaken online specialty or task specific education as a focus for updates, such as diabetes or spirometry. However, most nurses had undertaken education in lifestyle risk communication content and delivery in years past and relied on historical knowledge or experience of this. Funding mechanisms required GPs to be involved in most consultation types. However, some nurses undertook nurse-led activities such as through diabetes care, ECGs or ABIs and incorporated lifestyle risk communication within these appointment types. These nurses found that autonomously undertaking care enhanced their education, experience, confidence and their accountability. So I've just got a couple of quotes. I perhaps sometimes feel like maybe I don't have the right information for them or that some information has changed over the years since doing. I might have done diabetes education 10 years ago. I don't think there's that many vast changes, but I guess maybe that I don't know everything and I don't want to tell the patient the wrong thing, so maybe I won't say anything at all. And then there's this one. <clears throat> it's more nurse-led which means it's really important that we can give that advice on the day accurately, properly. Can't rely on just going, oh, the doctor, talk with them about this. So a bit more responsibility and accountability and planning because the autonomy of that has been really useful. 
It's made us all become more confident in what we're saying and know what we're saying. Communication about lifestyle risk was also dependent upon the GPN's assessment and perception of the patient capacity to independently make those lifestyle changes. Some nurses attempted to assist patient prioritisation of lifestyle risk prevention strategies in an authoritarian way. The presence of motivation by patients to undertake behaviour change was viewed positively by general practice nurses. And understanding the patient's goals, social determinants of health, as well as life or medical stressors form part of this assessment. This included, but wasn't limited to, the assessment of the patient's health literacy, domestic and housing situation, social supports and mobility status. To overcome some of these barriers, nurses describe giving smaller and more palatable amounts of information to patients, trying to support them to return to activities they previously enjoyed, or suggesting ways behaviour change could be undertaken. Nurses also believe that patients should be aware of why they are seeing the nurse and have a say in the attend their attendance prior to consultation. Within GPN appointments where lifestyle risk is to be addressed, such as care planning or he health assessment consults, some GPNs express concern that patients may not be fully cognizant of who they are seeing or the GPN's role. Nurses reported that some patients felt they would be seeing the physiotherapist or dietitian and not the general practice nurse. Sometimes they're unmotivated, but sometimes their life is really, really hard and they can't. They actually, it's, it's too much to ask to even cook one meal. It can be seen as silly or trivial to be talking to someone about that when they've got homelessness or they've got, there's bigger issues for them right now. I usually find the patient comes in here and hasn't got a clue why they're here, which seriously annoys me. So that's the thing, the health assessments. That's a fall down as far as I'm concerned here because they deserve a choice to say whether they want to come or not. Trust and rapport. Having that trust and rapport with patients was seen as a facilitator for lifestyle risk discussions by reading patient cues and assessing readiness for lifestyle risk change. Having an ongoing relationship and adequate time was believed to make people at ease during those consultations. Nurses, so to facilitate therapeutic relationships that enable lifestyle risk discussions, nurses felt they needed to be receptive, use conversational language, be a good listener, and care for the patient as a whole person. Well, first of all, identifying the risk. So you sort of do have to dig away. They're not going to just walk in and say, yes, I'm a pot smoker, I drink half a dozen beers every night. You've got to chip away and build up that trust and rapport with them. And there's, there were a few nurses that used that mining analogy of chipping and digging. Current funding arrangements and workplace organisation influenced prioritisation of lifestyle risk communication. GPN consultations where lifestyle risk could be included varied between 15 minutes to an hour amongst the participants. While collaborative relationships between nurses and the primary care team were valued by GPNs to support effective reinfor reinforcement of lifestyle risk communication, funding mechanisms required GP input with most GPN consults. Other methods of collaboration seemed to take place within the general practice between consults and team meetings. Collaborative relationships were also valued with external providers such as exercise physiologists or dietitians. There was evidence that some GPNs and practices prioritised and targeted discussion of lifestyle risk factors as part of various consultation types, such as blood pressures and care planning, provided that time and organisational support was provided. Organisational support assisting the prioritisation of lifestyle risk consisted of GP and reception support, software, templates, appointment duration, a private consultation space, follow-up appointments and action items. These factors facilitated GPNs to have an ongoing and individualised discussion with patients about their lifestyle risk. Having the time, having GP respect that you can work autonomously and they're not going to come in and contradict you. Their confidence in my abilities is quite good as well, so they're enablers. 
Them coming into the room as an enabler, having a consult room of its own where I don't have to move around is an enabler. I think time and money are the biggest. We don't, have, we don't get any billing for it. That means we have to invent ways of getting around that to prove that it's important. The GPN's ability to prioritise lifestyle risk communication was found to be complex and largely contingent on personal, professional and organisational factors such as experience, education, patient need, workplace priorities such as time and funding models. Health promotion and preventative care form part of the practice standards for general practice nurses. Health, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> in order to prioritise the prevention of chronic disease, health practitioners, including general practice nurses, need to work to their full scope of practice. However, the variability and reported enactment of lifestyle risk communication in this study suggests support for other literature highlighting issues in the optimisation of the GPN role, particularly working to their full scope of practice. The GPN's professional autonomy or a nurse's confidence to make clinical decisions of patient advocacy within their education, training, experience and scope of practice was similarly influenced by funding and workplace priorities, but also how the general practice nurses took responsibility for this. Patient and nurse empowerment and autonomy are linked with other professional benefits, including professional commitment and accountability. In this study, many nurses identified not having recent education relating to the content and delivery of lifestyle risk communication. Strong capabilities and effective communication techniques are required for patient engagement. A health promotion advice on its own is inadequate to facilitate behaviour change. Ongoing training and experience in patient-centred lifestyle risk communication techniques are required to maintain nurse confidence, motivation, communication proficiency and, and patient motivation for behaviour change. Suitable training and resourcing including capabilities in effective person-centred and culturally safe communication techniques are needed in the management of chronic disease. The skills in communication techniques to do this, such as motivational interviewing, are known to be effective in primary care and would provide support to lifestyle risk advice. However, the time demands for behaviour change counselling, such as motivational interviewing, require support. Relationships between the general practice nurse and patient and general practice nurse and other treatment providers was viewed as important in maintaining an ongoing communication in lifestyle risk. A person-centred relationship and method of communication was viewed as pivotal for lifestyle risk discussions so that patient needs and priorities could be met. Being interested and engaged when discussing risk is pivotal to gaining patient trust. Rapport, trust and time are known to optimise patient motivation and enablement for self-management. The health needs of patients with chronic conditions are rarely met by one treatment provider. Nurses valued collaborative relationships between treatment providers and support staff. This included relationships between the GPN and GP, practice staff and allied health. Positive experiences of this were discussed by GPNs through opportunities for allied health or clinical team discussions and managerial or reception support of recalls and appointment time. In this way, effective collaboration between providers is linked to improved patient outcomes, staff satisfaction as well as cost benefits. So lifestyle risk communication is known to support chronic, chronic disease management and general practice nurses are ideally placed within the community to provide this care. However, undertaking and optimising this role requires strategies such as ongoing and effective training in lifestyle risk communication content and delivery techniques, organisational support, prioritised time and supportive funding mechanisms. Collectively addressing each of these identified themes has the potential to better utilise the work of GPNs, improve patient care and facilitate patient self-management in lifestyle risk prevention. Understanding GPN needs and delivering lifestyle risk communication can thereby inform policy, education and practice requirements. And a very big thank you to the nurses who participated in this study. Without you, I wouldn't have a study. <laughs> thank you.